cautious after almost being lynched. A man came down the steps of the First Methodist Church, looking as if he had been waiting for us. I recognized him. Byram Cheney, a teacher at the grammar school. Byram had to be well up in his seventies by now. I had thought of him as elderly years ago when he was teaching me how to turn fractions into decimals. Evening, Jacob, he said. Ben? Jacob turned toward the streetlight to roll a cigarette. I hope Byram didn't startle you, Ben, he said. Glad you could join us this evening, Ben, Byram said. I think getting a first-hand look at things will be worthwhile for you. Jacob spoke up for you. Suddenly I realized that Byram Cheney had, in fact, been waiting for us. I turned to Jacob to find out why. I hadn't told him yet, Jacob said to Byram. Told me what? You had best go on and tell him, said Byram. We'll be to Scully's in a minute. I knew Scully as a man who owned a kitchen farm on the road south of town. Everybody who didn't have his own garden went to Scully's for whatever vegetables were in season. What's going on here, Jacob? Calm down, Ben. We're just going to a little meeting. Me and Byram thought it might be a good idea if you came along. I did speak up for you. What kind of a meeting? Just friends and neighbors, he said. Keep your mind open. Pretty much half the people in town, put in Byram. But they don't like to be seen by outsiders, said Jacob. That's why you'll have to wear this. From his knapsack, he pulled a white towel. Then I realized it wasn't a towel at all. It was a pointed white hood with two holes cut for eyes. I stopped dead in my tracks. A clan meeting, I said. Keep your voice down, Ben, Jacob said. We're standing right here beside you. We can hear. You must be insane, I said. I'm not going to any clan meeting. Don't you know it's illegal? The clan's been outlawed for years. Tell the sheriff, said Jacob. He's a member. As soon as I got over my shock at finding that my old best friend was a Ku Klux Klansman, I knew Cheney was right. I had to go along. This was exactly the kind of information Theodore Roosevelt had sent me down here to uncover. Chapter 77 Through the holes in my hood, I saw at least fifty men in white hoods and robes walking in loose ranks along the dirt road. Jacob, Byram, and I fell right in with their step. No one said anything until we were all inside Scully's large old barn and the doors had been closed. One man climbed up on a hay bale and ordered everyone to gather around. I followed Jacob toward the back wall of the barn. Our first order of business, he said, is to announce that we have a special guest attending our meeting this evening. He waved his hand. Was he waving in my direction? There was no way he could know who I was, not under that hood. Without a word, Jacob reached over and snatched the hood off my head. I stood revealed, the only man in the place without a mask covering his face. A murmur ran through the crowd. Benjamin Corbett, said the man on the bale. Uh, welcome, Ben. You are among friends here. We're not the ones tried to hurt you. I sincerely doubted that, but then he took off his hood, and I recognized Winston Conover, the pharmacist who had filled our family's prescriptions for as long as I could remember. One by one, the men around me began taking off their hoods. I knew most of them, the Methodist minister, a farm product salesman, a conductor on the Jackson and Northern Railroad, a carpenter's assistant, the county surveyor, the man who did shoe repairs for Klein's store, Sheriff Reese and his deputy, the man who repaired farm implements at the back of Sanders' general store. So this was the dreaded Ku Klux Klan, as ordinary a group of small-town men as you're likely to come across. 
Ben, we appreciate you showing up to let us talk to you. It was Lyman Tripp. Jovial, chubby Lyman had the readiest smile in town. He was the undertaker, so he also had the steadiest business of anyone. Maybe you'll see that we ain't all monsters, he said. We're just family men. We got to look out for our women and protect what's rightfully ours. I didn't quite know what he meant by rightfully ours. Byram Cheney tied a gold belt around the waist of his robe. He climbed up on the hay bale from which Doc Conover had just stepped down. All right. Let's get it started, he said. The men stood around in their white sheets with their hoods off, conducting the most ordinary small-town meeting. They discussed the collection of dues, a donation they'd recently made to a widowed young mother, nominations for a committee to represent the local chapter at the county meeting in Macomb. Just when it began to seem as harmless as a church picnic, Byram Cheney said, Okay, now, there must be a recognizing of new business related to the niggers. Doc Conover spoke up. I had two colored girls come into the drugstore last week. They said they was up from Ocean Springs visiting some kin of theirs. They wanted to buy a tincture of iodine. I explained to them, just as nice as I could, that I don't sell to coloreds. Then one of them started to lecturing me on the Constitution. When I told her to get the hell out of my store, she said she had come back with her daddy and her brother, and they'd make me sell them iodine. You say they's from Ocean Springs, said Jimmy Whitley, the athletic coach at Eudora High. That's sure what they said. Johnny Ray, ain't you got a cousin in the chapter down in Ocean Springs? I do. That's Wilbur Earl, said Johnny Ray. Byram Cheney said, Johnny Ray, why don't you talk to your cousin? Find out who those girls might have been. Then we can see about getting them educated. The crowd murmured in agreement. Another man spoke. I only want to report that that old nigger Jackie... You know, the one that used to drive the carriage for Mr. Macy? He come into my store again looking for work. I recognized the speaker as Marshall Farley, owner of the Five and Dime. Jacob leapt to his feet and spoke with passion. There you go, he said. Niggers looking for jobs that belong to us. That old coon's had a perfectly good job all this time, driving for one of the richest men in the county. Now he wants more. He wants a job that could go to a fellow like me, a good man, with a family to feed. In place of the polite murmur, a wave of anger now rolled through the crowd. I understood something new about these men. They weren't filled just with hate. They were filled with at least as much fear. Fear that the black man was going to take everything away from them. Their jobs, their women, their homes, all their hopes and dreams. Then I realized Jacob was talking about me. So if you ask me, I think it's high time we teach our guest a thing or two, he was saying. He needs to know we aren't just a bunch of ignorant bigots. I make a motion that we give over the rest of our meeting to the proper education of Ben Corbett. I looked around and couldn't believe what I saw. Half a dozen men in a rough circle were coming right at me. Then they were upon me, and they had me trapped for sure. Chapter 78 Feeling sick to my stomach now, my brain reeling, I rode in the back of an open farm wagon with Jacob, Byram Cheney, and Doc Conover. I was the one with hands bound behind his back. Cicadas made a furious racket in the trees, their droning rhythm rising and falling. We were driving south out of town into the swamp, an all-too-familiar journey by now. I was almost as terrified as I was angry. When I spoke to Jacob, I could barely keep from screaming. How could you do this? The one man I thought I could trust. Stay calm, my friend. 
I'm not your friend, I said. Ben, you can't help it if you got some mistaken ideas about us, he said. You'll find out. We're nobody to be scared of. We're fair-minded fellas like you. I just ask you to keep an open mind. By going to the swamp to watch you lynch another black man? I said, stay calm. After a time, we came into a clearing. I could have sworn this was the place where somebody hanged me, where I almost died, but it was a different spot altogether. Two men in white robes stood near a crude wooden platform. Between them, they held a man in place with a rope around his neck. His face was turned away from me. Let's go closer, Jacob said. This is close enough, I said. But it wasn't my decision to make. Byram Cheney lifted his reins and drove the wagon into the clearing for a better view of the murder. Slowly the man on the platform turned to face the crowd. He was a small man, frightened, pathetic. On his nose he wore gold-rimmed spectacles. The man was white. Chapter 79 his name is Eli Weinberg, Byram Cheney told me in confidential tones. He's a crooked little Jew from New Orleans. He talked three different widow ladies out of a thousand dollars each. He was selling deeds to some non-existent property he said was down in Metairie. And he would have got away with all that money, Jacob said. But the fellas found him yesterday hiding in the outhouse at the Macomb Depot. Eli Weinberg decided to speak up for himself. Those are valid deeds, gentlemen, he said in a quavery voice. What are you doing, I said. You can't hang him. He might be telling the truth. I felt my whole body shaking. Why don't you look into what he says? We did look into it, said Doc Conover. We got word from our brothers that he's been fast-talking his way into towns all over this part of the country. So have him arrested, I said. This is better, Conover said. We get the job done, no waiting, no money wasted on lawyers and trials and such, and we let them other Jews know they better think twice before coming to your door to steal from the likes of us. The likes of you, I said. Hell, you're all murderers! Eli Weinberg heard my voice. He twisted around in the hands of his captors to see who might have spoken in his defense. Murderers! Yes, that man's right! You are all murderers! Jacob said, You're missing the point, Ben. The Klan is here to fight against all injustice. We're not here just to educate niggers. We're here to educate anyone who needs educating. I narrowed my eyes and shook my head. You're crazy, Jacob. You and your friends are just a bunch of crazy killers. Eli Weinberg shouted out, Listen to him. He's right. You're all crazy killers. Those were the last words he spoke. Someone jerked hard on the rope, and Eli Weinberg's body flew into the air, his cheeks inflated, his eyes bugged in their sockets, his face turned an awful dark crimson, then slowly faded to gray. Vomit spilled from his mouth. His body jerked and trembled horribly. Within seconds, he was dead. A few seconds after that, the brilliant flash of Scooter Willem's camera illuminated the dark night. Chapter 80 the hangman's bowie knife made quick work of the rope. They let Eli Weinberg's body fall to the ground with a thud. I had seen ailing farm animals put down with more respect. You reckon we ought to bury him? A man said. Leave him where he lies, said Cheney. He said he had a son in Baton Rouge. We'll get word to our brothers down there. The son can come fetch him. Jews are supposed to be buried before sundown on the day they died, I said. It figures you would know all about Jews, said Doc Conover. 
Cheney climbed aboard the wagon.